Ross Tucker played for the Bills in 03 and 04 and has some great stories to tell. Plus, he tells us why he thinks this year's Bills team can go all the way. And the Princeton grad always has time for a little Ivy League smack talk. That's all coming up on this week's edition of the Buffalo Plus Podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Buffalo Plus Podcast. I'm Mike Catalano. We have a special guest with us this week. You know him from the NFL. Played in the league, played for the Bills, is a rising star, or how about this, already a star in media in the NFL. Ross Tucker joins us. Ross, thanks so much for being with us. Mike, my pleasure, man, on so many levels. You and I go way back. I, You know, I knew you were there, Mike, when I was there. But until I Googled you this morning, I don't know, you've been you've been doing that since the 80s, man? Uh, yes. And, and that's kind of where we wanted to go with this. My first game covering the Bills was Thurman's first game, okay? So I go way back to the Super Bowl years. And I tell everybody, the drought years to me were boring. I mean, there was nothing great about it. There was, you know, a lot of people try to make it interesting. The Bills' history wasn't interesting. But I will say this. Your time with the Bills, to me, was a fascinating time for this franchise. 2003, 2004. What was it like when you were with that Bills team, starting out with Greg Williams as your coach? Yeah, so a couple thoughts, right? Um, Number one, and and you've probably heard me say this, and I've talked about it on my podcast and elsewhere. I played for five teams, and my favorite team – best experience by far was the Buffalo Bills. Not Washington, not the Dallas Cowboys, not the New England Patriots. Everybody always thinks it's either going to be the Cowboys or the Patriots. It's not. It was the Buffalo Bills. I love living up there. I love the people up there. Um, I love being a part of the team. It was the most I played, you know, the most money I made, all that stuff. And I have a real affinity. You know, when I look back, on the NFL, for me, it was a roller coaster ride with ups and downs. But I primarily think of the the good times and the positives in Buffalo. It was interesting because when I went there in 03, you know, Greg Williams was the head coach. And Greg Williams is much maligned. You know, people love to rip on Greg Williams. He was great to me, man. I, I love Greg Williams. I, you know, I have a philosophy in life. I treat people, or at least I evaluate people based on how they are to me. Now, I hear what other people say, and I see when Greg says something in the media or whatever. It usually just makes me laugh, to be honest with you. Um, but he was great to me, and I and I appreciate him for that. And uh, I, I really like the guy. Um, you know, what happened that year was Eric Molds got hurt in 03 and we really didn't have anybody else and so you know defense was good but not quite what it was in 04 special teams okay but not 04 but offensively they really wanted to throw the ball Kevin Gilbride really wanted to throw the ball but peerless price had left in free agency Molds got hurt, and we just didn't have the guys. Josh Reed what really wasn't there yet. Bobby Shaw was a solid slot guy. But without Molds 100%, we had major problems. And the shame of it is, you know, my first two years, I was on team. Well, my rookie year with Washington, we were 8-8, eight and eight, so we were all right. Started off 0-5, by the way, and then went 8-3 and three in our last 11 games. In Dallas in 02, I started the last seven games. We were not very good. We were 5-11. and 11. So that 03 year in Buffalo, the first game, we beat the Patriots 31-0. And I was like, wow, we're good. Because I think the Bills have been 8-8 eight and eight the year before, and they thought we're going to keep building on it. So I was like, wow, we're, we, we beat the Patriots 31-0. And then the next week we went down to Jacksonville and smashed them. And I thought, wow, like we got something here. I'm on a, I'm on a legit team. And then 
the the wheels just kind of came off after Eric got hurt. When you think about that team, there you had some characters on that team. I mean, even on your O line, you had Ruben, you had Mike Williams who had come in. Uh, what was that group like in that time period, two thousand three, two thousand four, for you? Well, so to me, O uh, three and O four were very different teams and very different feelings. I can get into O four if you want me to, because sure. it's funny. I don't know if you've ever seen this, Mike, but like football outsiders, they've crunched all the numbers of like the last 20 some years. Our 2004 team that lost to the Steelers backups in the last game, we were beating the Steelers starters. We blew it against the Steelers backups. Otherwise, we would have made the playoffs. Is supposedly, statistically, the best team in at least the last 25 years to not make the playoffs. Now, we were 9-7. and seven. There have been 11-5 and five teams don't make the playoffs. But we had, like, one of the two or three best defenses in the NFL. We had the best special teams. I mean, Terrence McGee went to the Pro Bowl. He got us all watches. I was on the kickoff return team. He got us all watches. I actually took mine to the Galleria and exchanged – I don't wear watches, so I exchanged it. For one, I gave it to my wife for Christmas. She was my <laughs> girlfriend at the time. So thank you, Terrence McGee, for that Movado watch that I went to the gallery and exchanged. Um, but our defense, like, Mike, our D tackles were Sam Adams and Pat Williams. Like, studs. We had Schobel at one end. The other end was Kelsey and Denny, who were both solid. Our linebackers, Takeo Spikes and London Fletcher, are you kidding me? Our corners were Terrence McGee and Nate Clements, safeties uh, Troy Vinson, who was up there in years at that point, and Lawyer Malloy. Our wide receivers were a healthy molds, and Lee Evans, who had a great rookie year. Our running backs were Travis Henry and Willis McGahee, who had a great year. Bloods had a good year. I always say, like looking back on that team, I must have stunk. <laughs> because everybody else was good. How did we not have a better team? I mean, every position we had studs. And, and honestly, like, I remember this because Bledsoe used to give us – this is probably illegal, but Bledsoe used to give us 500 bucks cash on Monday if we didn't give up any sacks. There was a bunch of games, Mike, where on Monday in the team meeting, he would be handing us 500 bucks cash. Like – we had it rolling. I mean, we won those six games in a row. We weren't just winning them. We were killing people. And uh, it's a shame. I would have really liked to have seen what that team could have done in the playoffs because, you know, that's we started out 0-4. It was Malarkey's first year. Yep. We started out 0-4. We went 9-2 and in the next 11 and then lost that game when it turned out that the Steelers' backups, like, Willie Parker and James Harrison were good, really good. Um, Drew Bledsoe on that team. I, the thing I want to ask you about, Drew, is we see this dynamic with quarterbacks. We're seeing it with Aaron Rodgers, where we saw it with Carson Wentz. You bring in a guy. It changes the room. They brought in JP as a rookie. Now, even though, you know, he he was not playing – did it impact the team? Did it impact Drew in the way he thought of himself with that team when you use a first-round pick? Remember, obviously, Lee Evans was the one. Then they traded up, and they took and they took JP. You know what's funny, by the way, Mike? Like, I love just telling people the truth. As a guy – now, at that point, I'd already gotten a three-year extension – and I was feeling pretty good because in, in 03 season, I started the last five games, made the USA Today all Joe team. Donahoe gave me a three year extension as a restricted free agent. So I was already feeling pretty good about my spot on the roster. However, as a guy in my position who had already been cut twice, when the Bills traded up for JP, I was thrilled because <laughs> that was less draft choices less guys I had to compete against and no first round pick the next year for me to maybe compete against. I was thrilled. People never look at it that way. Um, 
JP was a different guy. I think he's like a coach at Clemson now, maybe or something. Yeah. Yeah. But he was a different guy. Uh, he was like the polar opposite of Drew in every way. Um, I don't think it affected Drew because I think Drew had a pretty good year. I think it affected the organization's timeline for Drew. And I've had multiple people tell me after the year when Donahoe, when they when the team moved on, and we went nine and two in that stretch after starting out 0 and 4 with a new head coach, new coordinators, everything. To let go of Bledsoe that offseason, I think they just cut him. I don't know if they, they – they, no, they, did they trade him to Dallas or just cut him? I can't remember. They, they, I think they ended up releasing him and picked up by Dallas. Yeah. yeah. So to cut him, I'll never forget that day. I called Valerio. I called Trey Teague. You know, this is back in 05. They didn't know about it. I was like, yo, man, did you hear? Like, well, I'm like, they just cut Bledsoe. And it's people need to know what that does to a team because we all kind of knew JP wasn't ready and it felt highly unlikely that JP was going to be the guy or at least very good that year. So it's so deflating. Like, I can't remember which one of those guys, but they were like, they were both not happy. And one of those guys said, I'm not going up there once all offseason. Like, when you get to eight, nine, ten years in the league, and they take away your chance to win that year, it is deflating. And I've had multiple people that were in the room tell me that that was an ownership decision. That it wasn't what the front office wanted to do, and it sure as heck wasn't what the coaching staff wanted to do. It was an ownership decision to move on from Drew to JP, and it really, truly set the franchise back years, yeah. years, because they should have given us another chance in 05 with Drew. Does the franchise history change if they win? if you win that Steelers game? Does everything change? I don't know that everything changes, but I think the organization's approach changes. I think um, the timeline changes, and there's no streak. I mean, at that point, the streak was, what, five years? Yeah. So it evaporates that streak that, that ended up becoming – what did it become, 17? 17, yeah. Yeah, it, that streak never becomes a thing. But then after that, it was just a rotating cast of characters, of GMs, of head coaches, of quarterbacks. I actually think Malarkey was a good head coach. And they uh, they sort of screwed up by what they did with Drew and then what they did with Malarkey because they could have had something good to build on there. And they blew it. Yeah. I mean, it's an organization that ended up with two coaches leaving with Malarkey, and then eventually it was Doug Marone. You know, you have coaches leaving with years on their contract without another head coaching job. I mean, that it just doesn't happen very often in this league. No, it doesn't. Uh, I don't know what Marone's deal was, but I know what Malarkey's deal was. They kept telling him he had to fire people, and uh, he finally said no. All right. Well, let, let's move on to more current because things have certainly changed for the Bills. The last time I saw you in person, we were at the AFC Championship game in Kansas City. There the Bills are with their shot to go to the Super Bowl. Doesn't go the way they want. Coming into this year, are the Bills now closer to Kansas City? Or would you say more likely the rivals of the Bills, the teams below them, are closer to the Bills? Off the top of my head, and by the way, Mike, it's always good to see you. And I appreciate the uh, – I told you off the air, but I appreciate the social media love at Ross Tucker NFL, especially with the press box food. Um, hopefully that will be back, some press box food buffets. Which I don't know what they'll do. Yeah. But um, I think right now there are three teams I think have a pretty good chance 
to go to the Super Bowl from the AFC. And those teams, in my mind, are the Chiefs, the Browns, and the Buffalo Bills. Those are my three favorite teams. Now, look, maybe the Ravens could do it. I have a tough time picturing Lamar Jackson making the throws he needs to make three games in a row to get to the Super Bowl. Um, I don't think uh, – Pittsburgh wouldn't shock me. Indianapolis wouldn't shock me. But I really do think it's the Chiefs, it's the Bills, it's the Browns. They have clearly the three best rosters in my mind. Like the Bills, Brandon Bean's done a phenomenal job. The Bills have a beautiful roster. I, I mean – they, they really do. Um, I think they're in a good spot. I think they're right there with the Chiefs. I think home field advantage would be nice and would make a difference. I think sometimes you have to walk before you run. And, you know, they walked last year. But even the year before, you know, Mahomes didn't go to the Super Bowl the first year. He got to the champ Conference Championship game and lost to the Patriots. Like, it doesn't seem like teams that often, I guess the Niners did a couple years ago, break all the way through, right? You kind of have to win a playoff game or two, kind of like Cleveland did, kind of like Buffalo did, and then you break through. And I would tell you, I think that those teams have a great chance to, to be in the Super Bowl. Those are the three. And uh, I, I think the Browns and the Bills are closer to the Chiefs than maybe other people do. Yeah, um, you know, I, I look back as we talked about, you know, I covered this team a long time back when they were Super Bowl teams. And it's there's a parallel here with Jim and that Bills team. You start in, you know, the 88 year where they sort of came out of, I don't say nowhere, but they were good. They were talented. They made the AFC championship game. And then the next year on the road, they lose to the Browns in a classic game, first playoff game. And it feels like a step back. And then they go on a run of four state straight Super Bowls. And I think with the way the AFC is, I mean, look at what happened in the playoffs last year. I mean, the Colts were driving with a chance to beat them. The Ravens game was back and forth until Taron Johnson's pick six. I mean, in this league, like, you can't assume anything. And that's the part I look at with the Bills as they could be really good this year, but you just don't know when you get in that playoff setting. Yeah, well – and that's totally fair. And the Chiefs probably could have, would have, should have lost to the Browns. Yeah. You know, when Mahomes got hurt. But my boy, Chad Henney, who I had on the Ross Tucker podcast from my hometown, he came in and delivered. But a lot of times that doesn't happen. Um, but they easily could have lost that game. Although the flip side is, to your point, I think, Mike, you know, the Bills could have easily lost – to Philip Rivers and the Colts. Yeah. So we could be singing a totally different su tune. You know, you don't just pick up where you were the year before. Um, you mentioned your hometown. I just want to quickly say, why well, I'm missing Pennsylvania is where you went to high school, right? Correct. Yep. It's about an hour west of Philly. Okay. Uh, I said famous alumni. Uh, you're on there with Taylor Swift. Do you and Taylor get together on music? Any of that kind of stuff go on? So she left when she was like 14 uh, to go to Nashville. I've met her a couple times. Yeah. I've talked to her a couple times. I'm actually pretty good friends with her dad. Oh, there you go. Her, her, her dad played football at Hawaii and Delaware, loves the sport, and there aren't many NFL guys from why I'm missing Pennsylvania. So we've become friends and talk fairly regularly. Um, it's funny because – from 2001 to 2007, Mike, I was the most famous person from Why Missing Pennsylvania. And uh, I was telling Taylor's mom a few years ago that, you know, I think Taylor beat me out on that. And she said, well, you know, just keep working, Ross. I'm like, <laughs> no, I think it's over. I'm like, I'm ready to call the fight. It's He's over. I'm pretty sure Taylor Swift's like the most most popular person in the world. Most famous person right. like like, I'm pretty sure it's over and I lost. That's a, that's okay. If you're going to finish second, that's a pretty good spot. Um, back to the Bills. Like, they give me a hard time all the time here because I'm a big proponent of 
Zach Ertz to Buffalo. I, I just think when you look at the Bills' history, they might have – and this is no disrespect to any of the players at tight end. They have never had a pass-catching tight end. And I understand that Zach Ertz is not Travis Kelsey, but I tell – how many Travis Kelseys are there in the world? Would you think if he's cut loose by the Eagles – and I know you've done the Eagles preseason games – if he's cut loose or there is a trade – do you think he would be a good fit with everything they're doing in Buffalo? Yes, I do. I think he would be great for the locker room. I think he'd be great on the field. You know, they've got Diggs. Now they've got Sanders. They've got Gabriel. Like They've got the ability to stretch the defense vertically. They've got Beasley underneath. And I think Dawson Knox is pretty good, by the way. I just think to have that reliable third down presence, you know, a Jason Witten type, if you will, I just think there's a lot of value there. And what the way it would manifest itself, Mike, is this guy has caught touchdown passes in Super Bowls. Okay? He's been there. I think he makes a difference – in a divisional or conference championship game, catching three or four third down balls for conversions to win the game. I really do. Yeah, I, I, that's why I, I just think he'd be a great fit. And I don't know, you know, the dynamics, you know, at this point of the year, everybody's playing a little chicken. You know, Howie Roseman wants to get something in return. We don't know if he'll ever get that or what it is, but, you know, some guys could still change teams at the moment. Um, the AFC East right now, uh, you know, we're seeing all the Tua stuff about interceptions in mandatory mini camps. Uh, and there's questions, obviously, until we see more of him. Cam coming back in another year and the Jets with a reboot. How do you see the AFC East against the Bills? Um, I think the Dolphins probably take a step back. I'm not a believer in Tua, and they were very fortunate in the way in which they won a lot of games last year. Turnovers, special teams, they had a lot of fluky plays go their way last year. I think they're more like an eight or nine win team in a 17 game schedule, as opposed to a 10 win team in a 16 game schedule. They don't have Fitzpatrick to save the day anymore. I think. The Patriots will be better, but I'm not sure they're that much better. I think the Patriots are a nine-win team. I still think the Bills are the class of the division, and the Bills are a you know, 11, 12, 13-win team. You but I will say this. I mentioned that I feel like the Bills have a beautiful roster. Tight end depth is an issue. Like tight end, you know, if Dawson Knox goes down, they're really light there, really light. Which is another reason why I like the idea of bringing in Ertz. When I look at teams for the Super Bowl, a lot of times I'll look at who's the next lineman in, who's the next receiver, and who's that like because a lot of times those are the guys that end up playing by the end of the year. Um, when you mentioned Fitz, he's a fascinating guy. Obviously, he's still immensely popular here. And my favorite Fitz stat is the fact that he started seven times against the Eagles with seven different teams. That in itself is maybe one of the most incredible stats in the history of the league, but it's so Fitz, isn't it? Everything about Fitz is incredible. His career, his story, what he's like as a guy. Um, I mean, he's awesome. I had him on the Ross Tucker podcast recently, he's hilarious. He tells the story of proposing to his wife at a McDonald's attached <laughs> to a gas station. What I love about Fitz, one of the things I love about Fitz, is he's kind of like me in that unless you knew that we went to Harvard and Princeton, you really wouldn't think so based on how we are. I always think it's funny when I see people and they'll be like, oh, you're the you're the press box food guy. <laughs> like when I meet people, I'll be like, wow, my parents must be so proud. They paid they paid that money for me to go to Princeton so that I could be the press box food video guy. Um, but yes, that is uh 
that is that is the guy. Yeah. Uh, okay. So now um, the Ivy League power rankings. Uh, you know, everybody gives them the Harvard thing. When you guys talk, I mean, where's where's Princeton with this in these power rankings of all the Ivy League schools? Number one. Uh, it's been U.S. News and World Report number one ranked school for like 10 years in a row. Uh, Harvard second or third. I don't know. Second's the first last, if you ask me. Second's the first loser. Look, I got into Harvard early action or whatever they call it of my senior year, like October. I turned them down because I wanted to go to the number one school in the country. I wanted to go to the most beautiful campus I've ever been to. And uh, I didn't want to go to a city school. I didn't want to go to Boston. I didn't, you know, so look, people go to Harvard has a big name because of Harvard Law School, Harvard Business School. Princeton is totally devoted to the undergraduate. And I think my podcast, Empire Mike, is a perfect example of that. That is perfect transition. Uh, first of all, I love the Ivy League smack talk, it's <laughs> phenomenal. Uh, the podcast. And the way it has grown, uh, tell everybody about it. I mean, because I, I think you are really a sort of a trendsetter in this and creating it from from the place of your knowledge and then building upon it with more than just one podcast. So um, I'm I'm just I really got lucky to be honest with you. Uh, when I retired in 08, started writing for Sports Illustrated. After a couple of years, ESPN hired me away to write for them. They asked if I would host their podcast. I said, absolutely, I would love to. Literally, Mike had no idea what a podcast was. I just knew they were going to pay me money to talk about football. And this is like 2010, maybe. So 2010, 11, and 12, I host the ESPN Football Today podcast. We have lots of listeners. They start to get advertisers. It's going, well, I'm making connections. And then I went out on my own. I brought a bunch of the audience with me. Got some. I gave introductory pricing to the advertisers, and then after a year, I added a fantasy show because I saw how popular that was. After another year, I, I added a betting show, the fantasies, fantasy feast, the betting's even money because I saw how popular betting was, and kind of took off from there. I, it would be very difficult if I tried to start it now. Um, I had the first mover advantage, they call it, and I. I'm lucky because I never would have thought of it if ESPN hadn't asked me to do it. Yeah. I, I mean, you also have, right, you do the business of sport, right, with Andrew Brandt? Andrew Brandt does the business of sports. I do the college draft as well, which is really fun to talk about the big college games from the perspective of, okay, here's the three best players in the game you should be watching for NFL fans. Yeah, and and in terms of doing that, um, you, I'm trying to remember all the other things that you are – still doing. I mean, you, you know, I, we hear you on a bunch of shows and different things. Are you still doing the Eagles games in the preseason? Is that yeah, still e fun? Eagles preseason TV, pregame radio. I did 27 games last year. I did uh, as a color commentator, 13 for CBS sports college, 14 for Westwood one NFL radio. So 27, which is like 27 more than I thought I might get. I thought I might get a goose egg, you know, with COVID and everything. And then I do a bunch of radio hits for uh, Odyssey. Um, they call it. I got all the podcasts. Uh, I write for The Athletic. A anything I can do, Mike, to avoid a real job as long as possible. And your wife, obviously, candidate for sainthood now, putting up with all this? You know what? She's pretty good, man. She she knows that uh, there's a lot of value in me loving what I do. I'm a happy guy. I've I never I've never called what I do work once. Like I always say, I got to do a game. I got to do a show. I never say I got to go to work. I feel like that's insulting the people that actually work. Yeah. Um. So I'm 42. Haven't had a real job yet, and not planning on getting one ever. Uh, and as a fellow girl dad, of course, my girls are grown. Uh, you have two, right? Two little girls. I posted on social media this week at Ross Tucker NFL, uh, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. They're awesome. They're nine and almost eight. My wife and I coached their softball team this spring, and I can't highly recommend it enough. I was a terrible baseball player. I'm probably a bad softball coach, but I love it. Well, it's great. Great to have family time. And, and it's really impressive with what you've done. 
certainly in your your now empire of uh, podcasts. And so you get told everybody where they can follow you, follow you on Twitter, subscribe and like the podcast, and we appreciate it. So to wrap it up here, your favorite team to play for was the Bills. You think the Bills have a shot to go to the Super Bowl this year, and no doubt Princeton is a much better university than Harvard. Believe. They had those shirts back in 04. I, I believe the Bills can get it done this year. All right. Well, it is awesome. It was great to have you on the Buffalo Plus podcast. We'll be following each other as things go through the year and uh, may see each other in person. And the press box food thing is is real. You 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 gave me the insight when we were in Kansas City that it was barbecue. Some places are really good. Other places got work to do. So it's good to keep them on their toes. My pleasure, Mike. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks again, Ross, for being on with us. It was great. And a reminder to you, thank you for being with us on the Buffalo Plus YouTube channel. A reminder to like, comment, subscribe. We appreciate your support for our entire team. Jenna Cottrell and Dan Fates, I'm Mike Catalana. Thanks for listening and watching to the latest edition of the Buffalo Plus podcast.